Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Sports History. I'm Professor Robert Romano, and we left off yesterday talking about the game of baseball, the history of baseball in the United States. And we kind of went through the fact that Abner Doubleday didn't create this sport. It was a, it evolved from the English game of rounders and that it took off, you know, uh, after the Civil War as the soldiers from both the Union and Confederate when Confederate armies went back to their homes. And they, that kind of um, worked to spread the game. So as the late 1800s come around, though, the game gets more and more professional. And as we said yesterday, yesterday in yesterday's video, that the National League um, popped up. It came on on February second, uh, eighteen seventy-six, and we discussed a little bit about you know if we were going to create a league, what what, what some of our expenses would be, and one of the biggest expenses would be player salaries. So, what the owners did at this time was they created this thing called the reserve clause. Okay, they put this in every player's contract. And this was a way to keep players' salaries artificially depressed. Okay, so when the National League created itself, it decided to put in every player's contract this article, Article 18. And take a second to read it. The party of the first part shall have the right to reserve the said party of the second part for the season next ensuing. The team mentioned in paragraph two, provided that said party of the second part should not be reserved for a salary less than that mentioned in the 20th paragraph here in. Wow. That's uh, an interesting article, isn't it? So let's think back to what it was like at this time. We're in the late 1876, late 1800s. The owners come together, put this reserve clause in, in, into all the players' contracts. Now, the owners are pretty savvy, right? They're, they're probably, probably familiar with contracts. They're probably familiar with lawyers. They're probably familiar with um, different clauses in contracts. And what about the baseball players? What about the, what about the, the people who are going to come and play the game? Do you think they're savvy? Do you think they have agents? Do you think they, they read this article and go, yeah, whatever? Well, for the most part, you know, this is a little bit confusing. So these young men coming off the field out of the factories wanting to play baseball were just so eager to play baseball, they just signed the contract, not even understanding what the Article 18 meant. And it was pretty, pretty interesting what this did, right? Because the reserve clause allowed the teams to keep a player in perpetuity, okay, on the terms dictated by the team and only the team. All right, so once you came and you signed that contract that first year, basically at the end of the year, that contract renewed for another year. And as long as they paid you what they paid you the year previously, it was perfectly fine. And then at the end of that second year, that old contract automatically renewed. And again, as long as they paid you exactly what they paid you the year before, everything was fine. So no matter how good you were, no matter how, how impressive of a season you had, um, you couldn't go to your owners and say, you know, listen, I want more money. I mean, you know, um, you know, I need to be paid more because I hit 40 home runs and stole 100 bases. Now, per the contract, per this terms of this perpetual contract, as long as they paid you exactly what they paid you the year before, things were fine. But what gave this, this uh, reserve clause its teeth, though, was the second unwritten part. Okay? It was the agreement amongst the major league team owners. All right? whereby the rights of each team to services of his players were observed by the other teams. Okay, what does that mean? So basically, at the end of this season, if um, you know I was a player and I had a great season and I went to my owner and said I want more money and they said no, what this clause means is that I couldn't go to another owner because that owner would not talk to me. That owner would not enter in, into negotiations with me because they agreed, the ownership agreed that they wouldn't do that, all right? You keep your hands off my players, I'll keep your hands off your players, all right? No matter how good that player was, no matter how badly they wanted him, no. They agreed that, you know what, that's your player, I will not enter into negotiations. So this really gave the, the reserve clause its teeth, right? Because no matter how good you were, you couldn't talk to another owner because they agreed with the other owner that they wouldn't talk to you. All right, so there's two parts to this reserve clause, the perpetual contract and then the, this collusion or agreement amongst the owners not to engage in contract negotiations, negotiations with the players not on their team, okay? The rights of each team to services of the players 
were observed by the other teams, right? So that's two parts. And that'll probably be a question on this week's quiz, okay? So this reserve clause um, stayed, began in the 1800s. And then when Major League Baseball was created in 1903, and Major League Baseball was created when the American League and National League merged, all right? So the Major League, that may be another question on the quiz. The National League and American League merged in 1903 to create Major League Baseball. Um, the American League teams agreed to this, to this reserve clause, right? They agreed to put every, um, the Article 18 into every player's contract, whereby it was a perpetual contract um, that went on in perpetuity and that they would abide by this agreement this gentleman's agreement between the ownership. Okay, and this was going along very well, right? Because this kept the player's salaries artificially low, right? Because if you don't have anybody to negotiate with, well, you play with what, you, you know, you play with what's offered, or right? you don't have any leverage to go anywhere else. And this was going along fine until around 1912, 1913, when another professional baseball league appeared, the Federal League. Now, the Federal League, they wanted to be a major powerhouse in, in, in baseball. So in order to do that, they needed the best players. So they agreed, um, the ownership of the Federal League, they agreed to sign players to multi-year contracts as opposed to this one-year renewable contract. And they agreed not to put the reserve clause in the players' contracts. So think about this. If you're a, you're a player, hmm, am I going to stay and play for Major League Baseball where you know, I'm stuck to this low, low, low value contract that I can't negotiate, or am I going to jump over to the federal league where I can sign a deal that may be worth a little bit more? And if I have a great season, I can negotiate for a higher salary the following year. All right. So this federal league appeared and they, they, they agreed to multi-year contracts with no reserve. So 220, over 220 major league baseball players jumped ship and went over to the federal league. Right? I would probably too. So if you're Major League Baseball, does this make you happy? Does this make you ecstatic? No, right? Because you're losing all your good players. They're jumping over to the Federal League. So what do you do? Do you take the reserve clause out of your contract? That's kind of their business model, right? They don't want to change that. They want to keep players' salaries artificially low or artificially depressed so they can make more money. So they really don't want to change their business model. So what can they do? Well, what they decided to do was buy out the Federal League, right? If you can't uh, compete with your competition, buy them out, right? Get rid of them. So they decided to buy out the Federal League, right? And they were successful in all aspects except for one team. One team, they said, nope, we don't want to be bought out of, uh, of our league. We want to play baseball in the Federal League. And that team was the Baltimore Terrapins. Okay, uh, the Baltimore Terrapins decided, no, we we don't want to be bought out by Major League Baseball, and we're going to continue on. The only problem is they didn't have any competition. Okay? All the other team owners decided to take the money from Major League Baseball. So what Major League Baseball, so what the Federal Baseball uh, Federal League did, and the Baltimore Terrapins did, was well, <laughs> we got nobody to play with. Um, we can't have a business like this, so they decided to sue the National League and the American. And there's a famous case called Federal Baseball versus the National League. And it's a pre preeminent case in for us sports managers to know. Because this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. Initially, the, um, the Terrapins sued and they wanted money damages from the National League. And the lower court said, sure. You know, based on this uh, theory of antitrust, um, you're right. You know, you can, you, well, since there's only one baseball league, Major League Baseball, you're violating antitrust. So they they decided to um, find in favor of the Baltimore Terrapins. Great. Um, but this Major League Baseball, not being happy with that, decided to appeal it and then appeal it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And again, so the Baltimore Terrapins sued under this theory of antitrust. Um, the lower court said yes and gave them some money damages said, here, here's some money for you to compensate you, to make you whole. Then Major League Baseball appealed it up to the Supreme Court. Now, it's interesting. In order to prove 
an antitrust case. In order to prove that somebody has violated the antitrust laws of the United States, you pretty much have to prove three things. Number one, you have to pr prove that there is a contract between two or more parties. Number two, you have to, uh, you have to prove that their conduct is anti-competitive or a restraint on trade. And number three, you have to prove that it, ha it has an effect on interstate commerce. All right, so for quiz purposes, you need to know this. In order to prove an antitrust matter, in order to prove that someone has violated the antitrust laws of the United States, you need to prove three things. Number one, that there's a contract between two or more parties. Number two, that it has an, uh, that is anti-competitive or has a restraint on trade. And number three, that it has an effect on interstate commerce. So let's think about this. This reserve clause, because this was the basis of the case. The, the Baltimore Terraprins were, were trying to show the court that this reserve clause is a violation of antitrust laws. The lower court agreed with them. So let's, let's do this. Let's think about this. Let's analyze this. So is the reserve clause a contract between two or more parties? It's pretty much an easy one, right? Or is it? Is the reserve clause a contract between two or more parties? Well, who are the parties? When I ask this in a live class, most, most of the students say, well, between the owners and the players because the players signed the contract. That's not necessarily true, okay, because the, the players didn't have any say into putting Article 18 into the contract. So the agreement or the contract is between the, the owners. They agreed to put the reserve clause in every player contract. So that first element is, is, is pretty much met, right? The owners agreed or colluded um, to put the reserve clause in every player contract. Number two. Let's take interstate commerce as number two. Does baseball have an effect on interstate commerce? Well, well clearly, right? What, what does interstate commerce mean? You know, business that goes over state line. There's a you know, business that takes place in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey. Yeah, and baseball has an effect on interstate commerce. Players travel between states to play the games. All right, the Yankees go up to Boston to play. We were down to um, Maryland to play. Um, the car, um, whatever, um, the multiple car, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm getting confused with the Terrapins. Um, so the players, coaches, fans, they travel between states, um, uh, merchandise, right? You can buy a jersey, you can buy a hat, no matter where you are. Um, you can watch, a watch a game on television. You know, I can watch the Yankees when I'm visiting my mother in Connecticut. So yeah, baseball has an effect on interstate commerce. So the third part. Does this reserve clause, or is this reserve clause anti-competitive or restrain trade? It's an interesting one, right? Well, it doesn't restrain trade in, in regards to that the player can't be traded. That's not, that's not what they mean. You think about it as a business sense. It restrains trade because the player's trade, their skill, is their baseball skill. And it restrains their baseball skill because they can't put that skill out on the open market, right? They can't send it out there to the highest bidder and say, hey, pay me what I'm worth. Because this reserve clause restricts them to only being able to negotiate with one team. And that's the team they're currently playing for. And if that team doesn't want to pay them anymore, well, they can't go anywhere else. It restrains that player's trade, right? Their skills as a baseball player. So in looking at it and analyzing it, yeah, it seems that, you know, this reserve clause is a violation of antitrust laws. Um, but as this case, and that's what the lower court said, but as this case made its way up to the, to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 not so fast. Okay, not so fast. Because in 1922, when this case was, was litigated or heard by the Supreme Court of the United States, the court said, no. We don't believe that baseball has an effect on interstate commerce. We believe that the business aspect of baseball happens locally or intrastate. It happens within a state. Hmm. We kind of think that it has an effect on interstate commerce. But back in 1922, the courts didn't think so. Because if you think about it, there was no TV. There was no radio. Uh, merchandise sales were pretty, pretty, pretty rare. Um, you know, the business aspect was basically a, a, a fan going up to the ticket the ticket booth and buying a ticket, purely local. The business aspect was give your money, get the ticket. That was intrastate. 
within a state. So, you know, the fact that players travel was incidental, the court said, was incidental to the, to the business model. So the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that baseball does not have an effect on interstate commerce. And therefore, since they don't have an effect on interstate commerce, they're not violating the antitrust laws. And the importance of this case is that from that 1922 ruling, baseball got an antitrust exemption. They are exempt from being sued for violating the antitrust laws of the United States to this day. And so there have been some limitations on it. But for the most part, baseball to this day has an antitrust exemption. They can't be sued for violating the antitrust laws of the United States. Wow, that's huge. Because think about it. If you want to run your business without fear of being sued for violating antitrust, you can. that's a big plus for you to run your business in a mon monopolistic fashion. Okay? So, but what about the other leagues? Don't the other leagues have a, um, have a right or have an antitrust exemption? No. Um, the courts said in, 19, in the 1950s in a case versus Radovich versus um, and the NFL, the NFL went to Radovich sued um, the NFL saying, you know, because the NFL put a reserve clause in their, their contract saying this reserve clause is a violation of antitrust laws. And the NFL were running the court saying, no, 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 listen, we're just like baseball. We, we get an antitrust exemption. And the court said, nah, maybe, but not so fast. It's 1950s now and things are a little different and baseball football's a little you know, you travel between states, so they did not, the Supreme Court of the United States did not give the NFL an antitrust exemption, nor did they give one to the NBA, nor the NHL, nor any other major sports property. So baseball is the only one, okay? And they still, like I said, they still have it to this day. It was challenged, okay? It was challenged in the 1950s in a case versus uh, called Toulson versus um, the New York Yankees. Toulson went back to court and said, listen, it's 30 years out. You said in Radovich that uh, the NFL doesn't get one because it has an effect on interstate commerce. You know, it's the 1950s. We're 30 years away from the uh, federal baseball versus the National League case. Baseball has an effect on interstate commerce now. It's 1950. And the court said, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, um, it does have an effect on interstate commerce. But we're not overruling ourselves. Nope, we're not going to change change our ruling. If you want to change it, go to Congress. Right? If you want to change the law, go to Congress. So baseball kept their antitrust exemption. And again, this um, 20 years later, fast forward another 20 years to a case called Kurt Flood versus Bowie Cole. All right. Now it's the 1970s, right? Late, late, late 1960s, early 1970s. And Kurt Flood at this time, he was a baseball player for the St. Louis Cardinals. All right, and St. Louis, the St. Louis, um, Baltimore, Baltimore. I can use that. Um, so Kurt Flood was a player for the for the St. Louis Cardinals. He played for the franchise for twelve years. Good player, all right, Gold Glove winner, um, batted at roughly three hundred. And after the twelfth season, he got a call from the assistant general manager saying, "Listen, Kurt, thanks for everything, thanks for all your hard work, but we're trading you to Philadelphia." So. Think about that. If, if you are a baseball player, if you're a human being, actually, and you, you know, gave your heart and soul to a franchise, you gave everything you had to a franchise, and then one day you got a call and said, yeah, yeah, we don't need you anymore, we're trading you, how would you feel? And that's kind of what Kurt Flood felt. He, he was like, no, listen, I, I deserve to be treated better than that. I deserve to have a say into where I wanted to to offer my skills, to to play my trade, right? To um, play baseball, I should have a right to say, "Listen, I want to stay in St. Louis if I if I want to. I don't I don't want to go off to Philadelphia." So, Kurt Flood, not being happy about this, decided to sue Major League Baseball again, again saying the reserve clause was an antitrust violation. And now it's in the 1970s, so 50 years away from from the um, federal baseball case. By the 1970s, yes, you would have to think that baseball does have an effect on interstate commerce, right? Games are on TV, um, more teams out west than in the south, players traveling further further away from their um, their home field, right, fans traveling, all that good stuff. 
So this case went again, made it all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And Major League Baseball went in and they argued, listen, you know, um, you gave us this antitrust exemption. We, we built our business practice on this. So, you know, you have to allow us to continue with our antitrust exemption. And in, in, in reality, you know, we need to get a return on our investment because we spend a lot of money on player training through the minor leagues, which cost us a lot. So we need this reserve clause in our in our contracts so we can get a return on our investment. Because if you allow the player to come play for us for one year, then go play for somebody else, you know, that's not that's not that doesn't give us the opportunity to get a return. So they went and argued that. The uh, the uh, the players went in and argued, no, 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 no. It's nineteen seventy. It's it's baseball definitely has an effect on it. And by the way, this 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 reserve clause is is un-American, right? It's it's it doesn't allow us to put our skills on the open market, right? It's totally against capitalism, right? We we should be paid for for our skills. We can't, you know, we shouldn't be our skills. The value of our skills shouldn't be depressed because because of a rule or a contract, uh, an article in a contract. So this case again went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court hemmed and hawed about it. But interestingly, at the same time, what Major League Baseball and the players, and now the players' union was was agreeing to, was like, they're like, no, no, no listen, this this litigation stuff is way too expensive. It uh, causes too much chaos and is way too long. So what they did was they agreed to put in in writing that any other disputes between the owners and the players would be um, arbitrated. All right, would go to an arbitrator. Right, because the arbitration process is a lot quicker and a lot cheaper. So while they were waiting for the Supreme Court, who was hemming and hawing over this decision to to uh, get back to them, they decided that they would go to binding arbitration for any future grievances. All right, so the Supreme Court came back and again found in favor of the reserve clause, found in favor of Major League Baseball, and said that you know what? yeah we understand that this reserve clause violates antitrust, but we're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> you know, again, go to Congress if you want. If you want to change it, go to Congress. Right now, we're not going to overrule ourselves. So Major League Baseball won again, and it, by doing that, kept their antitrust exemption. <sighs> Interestingly, so there was a player by the name of Catfish Hunter. Catfish Hunter was a pitcher for the Oakland A's, and he had an agreement with his owner, Charles O. Finley, that you know he was going to be paid hundred thousand dollars per year. With Charles O. Finley being the uh, crafty man that he was, convinced Catfish Hunter that you know what, Catfish, I'm going to do you a favor. I am going to pay you the hundred thousand dollars a year, but I'm only going to give you fifty thousand, and I'm going to take the other fifty thousand and I'm going to put it in in an annuity for you, in a savings account for you, so there'll be something there when you retire. All right, well that was really nice, right? Catfish was like, okay, that's fine. You know, I'm going to think about my future, all that good stuff. Well, after the second year, Catfish Hunter wanted to see, you know, what his money was worth. Right? $100,000 after two years, $100,000 was supposedly in this savings account. And it came to be known that uh, Charles O'Finley never invested that money for him. <laughs> right? He pretty much kept that money. So um, Catfish Hunter filed a grievance against Charles O'Finley. It went to arbitration. The arbitrator said that Charles O'Finley violated the terms of the contract and said that, Kathy Hunter, you can become a free agent, right? You're released from the terms of your contract, and therefore you can go and put your skills out on the open market. Wow. So Kathy Hunter, being a very good pitcher, was highly sought after, and he he, he was being paid, you know, $100,000 by... by um, Charles O'Finley, he put his skills on the open market. The New York Yankees signed him to a five-year, $3.5 million contract worth, you know, $750,000 a year. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty good increase. So, I mean, I think anybody would take $100,000 and get paid $750,000. So what happened, though, was all the other pitchers out there are like, oh, what, what, what's happening? What's going on? Um, we want to be paid more. If Catfish, I'm just going to pay $750,000. Why am I only getting paid hundred? So two, two other pitchers, Andy Messersmith and Randy McNally, decided at the end of their 
season to file a grievance saying this reserve clause is a violation of antitrust. Now, it couldn't go back to court, right, because the, uh, uh, the both parties, the owners and the, and the players, agreed to binding arbitration. So it went in front of an arbiter. So this little arbiter, probably was a professor at uh, Fordham University, um, heard the case again, basically the same case that was brought in the Kurt Flood, the Kurt Flood matter. And now you got to think about this. Could a arbitrator overrule the Supreme Court of the United States? Could the arbiter change baseball and say that this reserve clause is out? Interesting, right? You know, can a arbiter do this? So they've argued their case, and you know, the arbiter would got all the information, and then as time went by, the arbiter pretty much didn't do anything. And Major League Baseball called him and said, well, you're going to give us a decision? He's like, yeah, 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 I'll give you a decision. Well, why don't you go talk to the players first and come up with your own agreement? And nothing happened. And then a few months later, the baseball the players came and said, hey, we're going to get a decision. We need to know what to do. He's like, yeah, 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 I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Um, but why don't you go talk to Major League Baseball and come up with your own decision? Come up with your own agreement. Hmm. And nothing happened. The two parties didn't talk. So finally, on December 23rd, uh, the day before Christmas Eve, the arbiter filed his decision, pretty much saying that the reserve clause is up. The violation of antitrust laws, there's no more reserve. And he left and went on vacation. And, you know, you're thinking about this. Well, is this a good thing for the players? Is this a good thing for the owners? Well, no, it's a terrible thing for both sides. Because in one day... Everybody became a free agent. Everyone became a free agent. And this caused chaos. And, and what happened, what was going to happen was that, you know, some of the players would capitalize on being free agents, but the rest of them would because, you know, there's only so much money that the owners are going to spend. So a few guys, a few, a few players will make some money. The rest of them probably get stuck with less money than they were already being paid. And the arbiter knew this, and he kind of foresaw this. That's why he didn't want to file a decision. So what eventually happened was that the owners and players came together and they decided on some form of, of limited reserve. All right, so your player is under reserve for a period of time and each league gets different how many years and then after they, the player reaches that threshold in years, they're allowed to become a free agent. Okay, so this is a very important concept in, in, in sports. And as us as sports managers really need to understand this reserve clause. Because in part, it is still in effect today, right? Even though it was a bigger part back in 1876 when it was put into the first player contracts, it's still a part today. So we really need to understand it and how it works, all right? So if anybody has any questions, comments, or anything about this reserve, you know, great, give me a call, talk, text me, whatever it is, we'll take time, I'll go over it a little bit more. So I want you to read the article, Baseball Law 101, it goes into a little bit more detail about this reserve clause. And then if anybody has any questions or we can talk about it on Thursday during the asynchronous class. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your day.